do one little preliminary to let people gather until I get at least five YouTube followers. And here's one coming in. And there on live one YouTube. How are you doing, Nick? Mean, meanwhile. Um, I'm I'm good. I'm I'm actually heading into a lift right now, Skip. So I'll I'll be silent for about fifteen seconds. Okay, fine. <laughs> yep. Good morning, Yuan, and uh, welcome. Um, we Hi, are, Skip. Uh, we're just beginning, uh, so you haven't missed anything. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with the. Um, the last sentence that was in uh, Dr. Eisenstadt's essay from last week. And uh, so let me just give the preliminaries here. Um, today I'm reading from Jung's Red Book for, for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And it is edited by uh, Drs. Mary Stein and Thomas Arst. Uh, this is volume three. And this is actually the last essay in volume three, but it's quite an important one. Uh, so I, I wanted to bring it forward. Uh, Dr. Stephen Eisenstadt uh, is chancellor and founding president of Pacific Graduate Institute, of Pacifica Graduate Institute, an ex officio board of trustees member. Uh, he is a professor of depth psychology with a PhD in clinical psychology, a licensed marriage and family therapist, and a credentialed public school teacher and counselor. And he has served as an organizational consultant to companies and agencies worldwide and teaches extensively. Uh, Dr. Eisenstadt has explored the potential of dreams through depth psychology and his own research for more than 35 years. His dream tending methodologies extend traditional dream work to the vision of an animated world where the living images in dreams are experienced as embodied and originating in both the psyche of nature and the psyche of persons. Now, uh, I want to just begin with his, uh, the last sentence that he uh, had in what we read last week, uh, which is, let me begin how most things begin in imagination and dream. Now, the significance of this is everything that you can see uh, in the room around you, with the exception of potted plants, and I'm not even sure about them, but <laughs> certainly everything else uh, has its origin in imagination. We can't create anything unless we can first imagine it. And that includes you. Um, you were once a twinkle in your father's eye. And so there was some imagination involved there and here you are. <laughs> So, um, and so there's nothing more important to us really than imagination in our lives. And one of the things it occurs to me that we've gotten lazy about is imagination, because at least in the United States, and I can't say for other countries, but in the United States, we have so many movies and so many tele television programs that I think we've allowed our imagination to get flabby, to get um, not strong, not toned. And we therefore we tend to um, rely on other people's imagination. And so one of the big things that Dr. Jung spoke about often was uh, who's going to live your life if not you? Are you going to live someone else's life or are you going to live your own life? And so the, the problem is that when we go see a movie or we rely on a politician to solve our problems, um, we 
aren't solving our problems for ourselves and and often we can do that and so that uh, so today i'm going to read uh the main part one of this essay it's called dream tending a portal to journey and it's quite a fun section of this particular essay i'll i think you'll see what i mean in a moment um and um so it begins with a quote from dr young dreams are the guiding words of the soul they sh why should I henceforth not love my dreams and not make their riddling images into objects of my daily consideration? The spirit of the depths even taught me to consider my action and my decision as dependent on dreams. Dreams pave the way for life and they determine you without you understanding their language. And so that's the end of that quote. And so when I, when I talk about their language, we must understand that there are two parts of this. There are the parts of us that are here physically every day. And there is another part of us, which Dr. Jung referred to as the self or the greater personality, many different ways of referring to it, uh, the God image, but that other part of us is um, has evolved for three and a half billion years. And so in Dr. Young's time, he referred to it as the two million year old man, but really it's the three and a half billion year old man uh, or woman because uh, it has been developing ever since sex was invented. And the result of it is that all of our ancestors, everyone going back millions of generations in every one of us, uh, all of our ancestors did two things successfully. They survived until they reproduced. They survived until they reproduced. And, uh, and so that two million year old man is uh, there to help us survive, to give us the instincts we need and the, and the guidance we need to um, be safe. And so it comes up in dreams, it comes up in visions. Um, unlike like what people think, I believe that these dreams and visions are actually coming up all the time, seven by 24 by 365. <clears throat> the only difference is that um, when we're asleep, we're taking away um, the brightness of our daily life so that those things can reach our consciousness. And our unconscious learn to communicate with us in images uh, millions of years before we invented language, millions of years. And, you know, many creatures, all creatures that we can point to probably have ways of uh, indicating danger, let's say. And so, for example, a dog can bark in a certain way. Uh, birds will chirp in a certain way to indicate there's danger afoot and, um, and many other things. And so those are all uh, languages that those species developed. And we happen to be the beneficiaries of, of a language that has been developed uh, much more articulately and much. And so the structure of our language uh, that we use in our daily life uh, is is much clearer than let's say a dog's language uh, when speaking to another dog, <laughs> but um, but the dreams that we have are our unconscious's way of communicating with us, and so we have to pay great attention to that. Um, and um, 
And so let me go on now. So here's what Dr. Eisenstadt says. And let me just see. I wanted to see where I want to bring in. Okay. So my early experiences. Now he's talking about himself when he was a 12 year old boy. And he says, my early experiences with the transcendent have shaped my life's work, my approach to dreams, and the praxis of tending illuminated images. These same experiences have offered me a living relationship with the visions and ideologies of the Red Book. Okay, so Dr. Jung obviously had a living relationship with his unconscious as evidenced by the Red Book. And uh, it's important for all of us to have a living relationship with that. And so it's not a question of, of um, getting rid of nightmares per se. You have to get rid of the things in your life that your nightmares are talking about. And uh, so an example, uh, an example was uh, back when I was 40 years old, I was unemployed for about two years, which was truly shocking for me because I was uh, a lawyer, an MBA. I had run a company in uh, Japan for five years. And I thought, wow, with all that experience and so on, I should be able to get any job in Washington. Uh, but that didn't prove to be true for a variety of reasons. And uh, so my psyche at that time was sending me bombastic dreams. It was, they were dreams of execution. I was being executed uh, by firing squad, by beheading, by hanging, all kinds of things. And so every night I was being executed and my my psyche was trying to tell me this isn't good. You can't be like this. You can't be without a job. <laughs> and I'm saying to my psyche, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> Obviously, I was very upset by that time. And so our, our psyche tends to communicate to us in a bombastic way. And so that, that was my psyche's bombastic way of communicating with me that it thought my life was out of work, whack and everything was going to go south on me very soon as in an execution. Um, but fortunately I did uh, find a job and I founded a public company after that. So that was uh, uh, not the end of my life, but it was certainly uh, the end of that part of my life and part of what put me on to Dr. Jung. So tending dreams began for me. Now he's talking about tending dreams. Um, this is Dr. Eisenstadt talking, and I'm going to share with you an image uh, of Zuma Beach. And the reason I'm sharing this, which you will see in a minute. Now Zuma Beach is a beach in California. It is one of those long, broad, white sand beaches that are typical of the American West Coast. However, this is one particular feature at the south end of Zuma Beach. And so it's important to this story. Tending to dreams began for me in the, at the tide pools on Zuma Beach outside Los Angeles when I was 12. A rock jetty on the beach extended into the sea and separated the North Beach from the South Beach. So in, in the image that you're seeing right here, uh, you're looking from the North Beach toward where the South Beach is hidden behind those rocks. The North side was a public beach, which was popular with families. A sentry of lifeguards stood equidistantly across the beach next to a massive paved parking lot and a dozen food huts. Looming out into the sea, the rocky reef served a great divide between north and south. The north beach was supervised and civilized. 
the South Beach was a mystery. The accepted rules of water stipulated that no curious kid should ever venture over to the other side. I was troubled. Where were the, where, oh, I was troubled. Were there people on the other side, on that beach? I wondered, and if so, why are we not allowed there? When the tide was at its lowest, one could simply walk over the exposed jetty to the south. And I think in this picture, you could probably do that. Um, so when the tide was at its lowest, one could simply walk over the exposed jetty to the south. And on a family outing one hot July day, my curiosity got the best of me. After the towels had been laid out, swim gear donned, sunscreen applied, I quietly slipped away and wove through the crowds to the reef. The tide was out and I walked over the point and jumped down onto the sand. I looked all around me, taking it all in. Glistening tide pools appeared in every direction. The receding waves that had exposed long lines of brightly colored iridescent coral and hundreds of sea anemone and starfish still trembled with life dotted the brick beach. There were only a few people lying on the sand farther down the coastline and they were all naked. <laughs> that made quite an impression on this pre-adolescent kid too, but paled next to the kaleidoscope of dazzling marine life surrounding me. Sitting down on a rounded piece of sea-worn coral, I watched and listened to the teeming activity in this majestic corner of nature's universe. Mesmerized, I was suspended in time but was startled to attention by a voice behind me. Did you know that the rocks can talk? The words were haunting and prophetic. I was speechless. Who was speaking and how did he know? I did not think that anybody other than I could hear such things. I turned around to see that the prophecy emanated from a surfer in his late teens, a god of highest order to a 12 year old. He smiled at me and walked on down the beach. As I returned to the living energy of the tide pools, his transcendent utterance permeated the atmosphere. Having had their soulful eloquence affirmed by the other, the animated voices around me became more expressive and my hearing was sharper. Eventually I was jolted from this psychic community by an earthly reality. The tide was coming in. In a minute, the reef would be underwater. I leaped up and sloshed through the rising tide pools, scrambling over the flooding jetty as I hopped off the reef and landed safely on the civilized side. I breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, so I'll stop there for a moment. Any thoughts about that. Uh, I'll remove the, uh, let's see, I'm going to stop the share, but you get the idea, I think. Uh, Nick, do you have anything uh, you want to say about some, uh, about his experience on the beach? Um, sounds like something I wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we've all had an experience or two like that. I um I was fortunate to be raised in the Navy, so um my parents were often around the water. Uh even when we lived on the desert. We lived on the desert for three years when I was very young. Uh, but we had a beautiful swimming pool that we could go to. And so there were always uh, um, beautiful people in bathing suits around me, and uh, I can I can just imagine what it was like at that point. <laughs> um, and so, uh, 
what Dr. Eisenstadt is, is talking about here is the kindling of his imagination as a 12 year old kind of initiation type of thing. And all of us need to be initiated uh, and we get initiated every, every day uh, by something new. Yeah. I mean, I'm initiating this group of uh, now 15 people, 12 on YouTube and uh, three here in the panel um, on what Dr. Eisenstadt's thinking was right now. Um, but anyway, um, I can go on a, a bit farther and uh, don't hesitate uh, if you're on YouTube, don't hesitate to ask a question in the chat and uh, let me read a little bit further. My parents awaited. Steve, where have you been? My mother asked. For me, this was an all too familiar question. What could I say? I have been to a place where gods exist, where rocks can talk, where the landscape has stories to tell. No, this explanation would fall on deaf and suspicious ears. Here on the civilized side where food stands, parking lots and lifeguards secure the beachscape, rocks do not speak. The ocean and her creatures remain mute Dream tending, dream tending is rooted in the realization that a multiple, at multiple levels of psyche, everything is dreaming, the creatures, the landscapes, and all things in and of the world. The inner subjectivities of living things, uh, their particular soul sparks, their voices and their pleas appear as images in our dream life. When we take the time to listen closely, as I did that afternoon long ago on Zuma Beach, the inscapes come to life in new and wondrous ways. I have come to see and hear these living dream images of the animated world in the actuality of their being, not just my own. So, what he's saying is that um, when we pay attention uh, to our psyche, our psyche pays attention to us and uh, we actually bring it to life and uh, we become aware of things that are not in our conscious mind uh, and that are quite important. And I think this passage where uh, he asks these questions, um, what, uh, where his mother said, where have you been? And he said, what could I say? I've been to a place where gods exist, where rocks can talk and where the landscape has stories to tell. Well, certainly there was a story there. And uh, I think we've all been in that uh, situation of not wanting to say what we were really thinking about at any given time. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like uh, your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend saying, what are you thinking about? And you go, uh, yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk about that. <laughs> uh, if you have had that experience, then you know what I'm talking about. So we go on. Um, he says, I have discovered that when tending dreams or reading the Red Book, what matters most is not what I see, but how I see it. When we engage different modes of perception, we ask new questions. Our inquiries originate from the outer side of the rational mind, or I'm sorry, our inquiries, our inquiries originate from the other side of the rational mind, from the other side of the reef. The explanatory yields to the experiential. Who is visiting now and what is happening here evoke an ex imploring imagination and they are much more interesting questions 
than the prosaic, familiar, rational queries, what does this mean and why did this happen? Okay, so he's making a differentiation here between, um, between being very rational about it and um, wanting to understand what's going on experientially. And there's a, there's a funny quote. Um, I don't remember if it was Dr. Jung or it might've been James Hillman who said that, that scientists are in the business of proving that they are meaningless. <laughs> by uh, if you do everything very rationally, um, then, then you may be meaningless because, um, because everything is ruled by rules and cause and effect. And yet you do, you are um, intermediating uh, between, um, between something that's dead or everything around you uh, has been built by rationality perfectly uh, with it, you know, even, you know, everything is around you is a solid item and it was built perfectly. Somebody designed it, manufactured it in a perfect way so that you would want it. Uh, you would see it as a beautiful item, but none of it is alive only you are alive. And so it's your intermediation between um, the designer and the item, which brings it to life. And so as I often say, um, you know, a Bible is just a black doorstop unless somebody brings life into it. Um, and uh, Annette has joined us on uh, YouTube and Welcome, thank you, Annette, for joining us today. And so these two questions, it seems to me, are, are very significant because um, you know, what is happening here? Asking the question, what is happening here? When you have a, let's say you have a nightmare, you know, the question should be, uh, what is my psyche trying to warn me about, tell me about, because that's what nightmares are, are warnings. Um, and asking us, saying to us, well, your life is out of balance in some way. Um, and, uh, you know, who's involved in that visitation? But if you say, what does this mean? then you're trying to concretize it, which is a, a logos type of activity. <clears throat> and uh, if you ask, why did this happen? Um, rather than what is my psyche trying to tell me? It's quite a different perspective. Now, let's see, I should have put onto my screen here. Um, See if I have it. Just uh, okay. So, um, what I want to emphasize to my YouTube uh, subscribers is uh, there's a way to register so that you can become a part of our panel on the Zoom chat, and there is the link. Um, and people that are on Zoom, um, I'm giving you the link, but uh, you are already in, in the ma mailing list. But for those of you who are watching on YouTube, uh, that is the link uh, through which you can uh, get notices about these sessions and also uh, learn the YouTube links that are uh, necessary to join the panel. And I hope you will uh, join with me uh, in the panel. It's always nice to have people that will chat with me uh, live um, and uh, keeps me moving uh, 
fortunately I have some friends who are here who uh, do that with me from time to time and I appreciate that. Um, all right, so going on with this uh, story now, Dr. Eisenstadt says, I remember as a child, high play invited the world to display itself in magic, mystery, and beauty. When I met those, these wonders with an innocent poetic eye, the world responded poetically. And uh, so what comes to my mind and, and memories often come to my mind um, when I'm reading these things. When I was in the fourth grade, um, I lived in a, in a farming community in Michigan and I went, I actually went to a, a country school, a two room schoolhouse where uh, kindergarten through first through third grade were in the basement and in the upstairs were fourth, fifth and sixth grade. So what that meant, and there was one teacher for each room. And so what that meant was that my teacher, Mrs. Stahl, who I still remember, um, had to teach three grades. And, um, and so as a fourth grader, I was able not only to do my own lessons, which she was giving us, uh, but I was able to listen in on the fifth and sixth grade lessons as well. Um, and uh, I enjoyed that very much, but I would go back and forth to school on a bicycle. And in that part of Michigan, which is called the fruit belt, quote unquote, fruit belt, where many fruits that we enjoy uh, are, uh, there were many grape vineyards and, and wineries in that area. And so I remember seeing the wonder of all these beautiful grapes there and so on. And one, one day I was just too seduced by the beautiful grapes that were growing on the vines. And I, and I got off my bike and I went off into the vineyard. Uh, maybe I was uh, 50 yards off the road and I started to eat the grapes. And lo and behold, uh, probably the, the farmer uh, just was driving by or whatever, but uh, he, he stopped and came and, and chastised me and uh, gave me a bad time for eating his grapes, but it was a mysterious and wonderful moment for me, a, a numinous moment that you know, God had given these grapes to me to eat. And it never occurred to me that these grapes were, you know, belonged to someone and they were part of his livelihood. And um, so I learned that lesson. <laughs> but for those moments, let's say it was five or 10 minutes that I was munching on the grapes before I got caught. Uh, it was just a transcendent moment, a mysterious moment, a beautiful moment. Um, and so the world was responding to me poetically in the way that Dr. Eisenstadt is talking about, but then the world uh, responded to me in a not terribly poetic fashion too. Um, <clears throat> so it was only when I went into my head encouraged by school and fueled by new miracle sciences of the times that I seemed to go deaf and blind. Adults were working so hard trying to make sense out of it all that they failed to see the inner luminescence of all being, the human made and the nature made. In the red book, Young Notes, quote, and when you sleep, you rest like everything that was and your dreams echo softly again from distant temple chants. You sleep down through the thousand solar years, and you wake up through the thousand solar years, and your dreams full of ancient lore adorn the walls of your bedchamber. And so again, what Dr. Jung is talking about here is the dreams are often prevent, presenting to you uh, historical events that um, maybe many 
human beings have experienced. Um, and my, my thought is, well, okay, if you had a vision of a tiger, um, it would warn you that there might be a tiger or other present predator present. And we sometimes have those dreams. We sometimes have dreams of snakes, for example. And obviously snakes were predators toward great apes who were living in the trees. Um, and so if you have a dream of a snake, that would be a warning. But as we know from history now that the snake also represents uh, a learning uh, and an in interaction where they intertwine. And so that's why uh, snakes appear in the caduceus, uh, which is the symbol of medicine and why um, things that are, some, are venomous sometimes can be also medicine. Uh, and this is, you know, something that human beings learned after uh, having many bad experiences, I suppose, with uh, snakes over billions of years. Uh, but our psyche still remembers these things and, and keeps them for us for a special time. And they get triggered. Something happens uh, in our life that makes us think of snakes. And, uh, and we have a we have a very deep interaction with snakes and tigers and uh, the idea of um, falling out of a tree. Many, most of us, I think, have had the experience of waking up with a start when we're sleeping, especially when we're young, and uh, and that's a reflex that comes from living in trees and um, the the relatives of our ancestors who didn't wake up uh, when they were falling um, got eaten. Those, those people um, got eaten by tigers or snakes or what have you. But our ancestors, because we all survived, um, all developed a reflex that caused us to wake up when we were falling out of the tree. And as a result, our direct ancestors um, didn't get eaten very simply. And so we are the, we are the living proof of, of that experience of evolution where those that woke up and caught themselves before they fell out of the tree survived, but those who didn't wake up didn't survive and also didn't reproduce. So uh, Dr. Eisenstock goes on, animated images come to life when given attention and regard. They tell their deeper stories and offer lustrous light from the inside out. During this quintessential, quintessential process, two essential questions arise. What is the dream's desire and who journeys now? These queries move dream work and discovery in a distinctly vertical descent down further still into deep imagination and into explorations that I have come to know as the digs. Um, so <clears throat> um, <clears throat> what is the dream's desire? What is it trying to tell us? And who is journeying? In other words, um, there's, is there a part of us that's moving us toward something? Now, one of the important things to understand about individuation is that it is a process that goes on all the time, whether we're conscious or, of it or not. And so that what that means is that every living creature, um, and, and so let me talk simply about a tree, an oak tree. Uh, every oak tree is an oak tree, but every oak tree is different. And so 
every acorn knows how to become that oak tree and it knows it from the time the the acorn um, is fertilized and starts to grow <clears throat> and the same is true of us um, our unconscious knows how to become us each of us um, in our own unique way and it continues to do that regardless of trauma with regardless of roadblocks so for example uh, we may think that oh we have to become a this or a that we have to become a fireman lots of young boys especially um, want to become a fireman because they hear uh, the siren sometimes and it's very exciting when a red truck goes by blaring sirens and it gets their attention and they say wow i want to do that that looks like fun and <clears throat> and so then what happens is you get blocked because your parents let on in one way or another, perhaps unconsciously, uh, that you're not going to be a fireman. <laughs> they have higher aspirations for you. And, uh, and you don't know what a fireman is when you want to become a fireman. But <clears throat> once you realize what a fireman is and the fact that they take their lives in their hands every time, they go out on a call, uh, maybe you don't want to be a fireman either. And so it takes a, a special kind of person to be a fireman. And not to say that there aren't many people who are called to it. Um, and, and so they develop as a fireman, but most of the rest of us don't. Um, and so, but in any case, when bad things happen to us for one reason or another that stop us from doing one thing, then our psyche says, okay, you don't want to do, you don't, you can't do that, or you don't want to do that, fine, then do this. And so um, I always like the quote from uh, the movie, The Sound of Music, where the mother superior says to Maria, well, uh, sometimes when God closes a door, he opens a window. And what is meant by that, I think, if we think of it in terms of depth psychology, is every time you get blocked by something, um, there another opportunity presents itself that your, your psyche is able to work with. Um, and uh, you know, and it's it, one can't imagine what it is at the time, but it simply evolves. So, uh, you know, as a Marine Corps officer, I broke my leg after 23 years, and uh, that was the end of my Marine Corps career. Um, and you know, that that seems like a pretty hard stop because Marines are as we say, ground pounders uh, who are doing a certain type of thing. Uh, and everything that I had to do after that was quite different. And, you know, after that, I founded a company which uh, succeeded for 18 months and then it failed. And then it succeeded for another couple of years in a different way and that it failed. And then it finally started to succeed a third way. Uh, and then it went public. <laughs> and, and so, um, so you, you just can't predict how these things will come up in your life. Um, and so, you know, when it went public, it seemed like everything was going to be hunky dory and wonderful in my life. And uh, then the crash of 2008 came along and I lost all of my life savings uh, in that crash. <clears throat> and so even though I've had huge um, 
you know, high points in my life, then that high point gets counterpointed by a huge low point. And, um, and so then what do you do to, um, to go on living while well, you have to do something? And so that's what Dr. Jung's work has done for me. It's guided me through this process uh, for decades now. And, um, <clears throat> you know, even though, you know, I don't earn my living by being a Jungian analyst, and I'm not a Jungian analyst, nor am I a mental health professional, I know what I know in terms of how these ideas help me in my life and help me see that there is a future no matter what happens, okay? And so, um, uh, You know, people have horrible things um, happen to them. Um, just a second here. Uh, yeah, so um, what I was just having a momentary mind freeze on uh, the name of um, Tammy Duckworth. So let's talk about Tammy Duckworth. Tammy um, was a woman who became a helicopter pilot. And, you know, that's no small thing to be able to become a helicopter pilot. And then she was shot down in Iraq and uh, she was very grievously injured and lost both of her legs. Um, and that sort of circumstance uh, must seem like a, a truly hard stop. I, I know <laughs> while I was 13 weeks with my leg up in the air um, in 1990, uh, you know, I was pretty much stopped. <laughs> You know, I wasn't going anywhere, and, and uh, I'm sure that Tammy Duckworth went through a much longer time because of her recovery from losing her legs, um, and yet she emerged as the U.S. Senator from Illinois, and uh, so all of us can get through should get through if we know, if we can call upon our greater power. Now there's a couple, and, and it's, it's amazing how you renewed yourself many times in very many different ways. And then she says, my husband had the same before I met him and your spirit speaks through you. Yes, um, well, I believe everyone's spirit speaks through them and, um, we all have these these uh, traumas, these roadblocks that we run into. And so, for example, an oak tree uh, might have one of its limbs cut off because the telephone line has to go through right where it is. And if that that limb stays there, it's going going to um, interfere with the telephone line. So what happens? It simply grows another limb. That's what an oak tree does. And uh, every creature does that right down to a scorpion or amoeba. <clears throat> every, every creature has the spirit moving within them and um, does the next thing that is comes from the unconscious. It doesn't come from the conscious mind because most Creatures don't have a, a conscious discerning mind to work with. They, they only have instinct and, uh, and yet they go on. And so, you know, a, a stray cat that gets run over and has its leg ripped off, if it survives, um, it will continue to be a cat and, and, uh, and manage on three legs 
very easily and and uh, dogs do the same thing and so um, you know so there there are many different things that can come up and so look everybody has trauma this is what we're learn what we learn in maturity that we are problem solving creatures we are problem solving creatures and childhood is about learning how to solve problems and learning how traditionally we solve problems and then when we reach maturity then we invite <laughs> new problems we we uh, end up finding a, a partner a spouse and we start to have children and those, you know, creating a family and, and developing a family has its own uh, problems, which, you know, obviously billions of people experience all the time. We have seven and a half billion of us on the planet. And, um, sorry, my word processing program is going crazy. Um, so we have seven and a half billion of us on our on our planet and we all uh, learn how to solve problems and to teach our children how to solve problems. And it's up to us to enact um, the world we want. In other words, uh, there is no kindly Geppetto up there in the sky that's gonna pull our strings and give us um, riches or or anything else that uh the god that's going to see you through is here in your heart not there and and so um so you need to learn to listen to that uh power uh, within you that is going to get see you through and so no matter how th bad things get no matter how awful uh they get um good things will come if you just pay attention and i don't think we are uh we educate our young well enough uh to understand that to understand that there's there's nothing that is um, that's going to finally stop you. Um, only you stop you. And Samantha says, "Is this live? Hi, happy birthday, happy belated birthday." Yes, I'm live, Samantha. Thank you, Rocket King. Uh, yep, it was my birthday on the fifth. Uh, that was my day last Monday. And so tomorrow, which is the 12th, uh, Monday, uh, we will be continuing on with um, the Tarot as a Roadmap for Life. And we'll be talking about how the divine realm, the, the invisible but definitely their realm, um, acts upon us all the time. That's what the Tarot cards talk about. And so... Um, you know, people say that there, there are no invisible uh, forces, but there definitely are. And that's what the archetypes are. And that's what, that's why the tarot cards have not changed in 500 years. I mean, the first tarot deck uh, was, uh, was invented, uh, at least 500 years ago and ever since then, since the Marseille deck, which is the earliest one we can point to, even though sometimes um, they, even, even though sometimes somebody who's creating a tarot deck will make a cutesy new name, um, but they really are talking about the same energy. So <clears throat> if we talk about, um, the hermit as a, uh, as a, one of the cards in the tarot deck, the number nine major arcana, it's talking about um, the energies that go into self-reflection and into 
uh, guidance for young people and that sort of thing. Uh, and I, this week I bought myself a, a new trick tarot deck called the, the Starman Tarot. And the Starman Tarot is based on uh, images that were done for David Bowie. And the person who, um, who created that deck decided it would be fun uh, to change the name of the hermit card from the hermit to the alien. And so there's a picture of an alien <laughs> on that particular card. And, uh, but the point is that a rose by any no other name will smell as sweet. And so while I'm not particularly fond of the idea of changing the names, um, uh, they still point to the same energies and those energies are invisible. You cannot touch them. You cannot measure them, but nonetheless, they exist and they are here and they make our lives around us. So if we understand those energies, uh, we are going to understand how our lives uh, work. And uh, the other criticism I have is uh, that that particular uh, tarot maker, uh, creator, uh, changed the fool card to the clown. And uh, I don't agree with that because uh, the clown makes it sound like you're not a serious person, uh, whereas a fool can be a serious person. And so I really question the idea of changing the, uh, these names. And, uh, and so even though I am bemused by that particular deck, um, I, I'm not really thrilled by the fact that we're changing um, what the meaning of a card is because it, it, there is, you know, words matter, and uh, the fool is what we all are. We're all, we all foolishly launch on our lives and on all of our projects in life. We don't know what's around the bend. You know, if you think of <clears throat> the movie Out of Africa with Meryl Streep and uh, Anyway, in, in Out of Africa, she says, well, it's a good thing that we can't see too far ahead to know what's going to happen in our lives. And that movie is a great metaphor for what happens to people. I mean, she launched on a, on a new life by going to Africa and she married a man she didn't love because she thought it would be work out well. And, and he ended up giving her syphilis. And so she had to go back to Denmark and, um, you know, it led to a, a bunch of things. She couldn't have natural children. And so um, she ended up um, making her children be the, her writing. Uh, this is the author Isaac Dineson and uh, some remarkable things happened there. Um, and uh, Tamara Russell is here. Good to see you, Tamara. Uh, and Rocket King says, I just looked at the Starman Tarot on Google Images. It actually looks pretty awesome. Well, it does have an awesome box. I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. That's why, that's one of the reasons why <clears throat> I bought it. And also, I thought it might be a suitable uh, gift for my friend, uh, Eva Ryder, who uh, did a Wisdom Path session here a few weeks ago, about a month ago, uh, since she said that her muse was David Bowie. And so, but then fortunately, uh, I, after I had the car, the deck in hand, um, 
I sent her an email and asked her if she knew about it. And she said, oh yeah, I know about it. And I don't really, <clears throat> I'm not very thrilled with the images in the deck. And uh, so I, at that point I hadn't opened <laughs> the box. And, uh, and so then I didn't give it to her as a gift since she already knew about it and had tried to send her, her set back uh, because she didn't like the images. And uh, so I opened it up and I found uh, that I had to agree with her in, uh, in large part, but, <clears throat> but I do like the box. The box is awesome and it's very impressive. And I am going to enjoy using those cards as part of my education system on the Turo as a roadmap for life because um, the book in that set uh, is very good. It's very well written and it really uh, exposes what it is that each card means very well. And so I really like the book aspect uh, of that particular deck. Um, I'm not, uh, I'm not thrilled with the images, but you know, what the heck, I'm uh, now 74 years old. So there might be people that are in their 20s or uh, 30s who might think it's just wonderful. So I, I, that's just my taste. Um, so uh, Isaiah says, uh, speaking of the unseen forces are the old beliefs mindsets and gods of our ancestors of any relevance to this day and age, especially when they are extreme contrasts in specific themes. <clears throat> well, let's say this. Yes, they are definitely very relevant. And that's why um, I, I've read with uh, Kushbu Kantaria and I have read the Bhagavad Gita together. I hope we're going to finish it this coming Tuesday. <clears throat> but the point is that I've been having numinous experiences around uh, the Bhagavad Gita um, steadily since May the 9th when I got the cop one of the copies that I'm reading and I opened it to a specific page uh, to Discourse 10, verse 19. That was the first verse I had looked at, and I have it here. And I said, oh my God, this is a description of the self from a Jungian psychology point of view. And I came to realize over the last five months that many of the things that are in Jungian psychology were already addressed by the ancient Indians 5,000 years ago. It's said that the Bhagavad Gita is 5,000 years old. It was written down for the first time between 200 BCE and 200 of, of the Christian era. So during that 400 year period, around the time of Christ, it was written down, <clears throat> but it existed in a verbal tradition, oral tradition, uh, long before that. And uh, yesterday, I, I Pushpu and I tried to uh, read the last few verses uh, yesterday, and uh, we were stopped because Kushbu didn't have electricity in Bangalore. Um, and so we were able to do a WhatsApp call. And um, so we were chatting about it and I had read ahead to the last uh, few verses. And suddenly I remembered that I had been involved in a one act play in my senior year of high school. So I'm talking about in December of 1963, um, I had a part in a play and there were two main characters, three characters, but 
two main ones, the emperor uh, and um, his counselor, his advisor. And suddenly it dawned on me that he and I were playing, and I played the advisor, and it dawned on me that he and I were playing uh, Arjuna and Krishna from the Bhagavad Gita. And I saw the parallel between the play and uh, the Bhagavad Gita directly, even though the play itself was, uh, this was in my high school in Japan, it was American high school in Japan, in Yokohama. And uh, the story of the play is that um, Tenyo, the play is called a the, a, the gift of Tenyo. Tenyo is the daughter of the emperor, and she's trying to give, convince her father, the emperor, to, um, she's seen the star of Bethlehem, and she's trying to convince him to go uh, take gifts to the new king who is being born. And so the idea is that he becomes one of the three kings that go and uh, give gifts to uh, the Christ child on uh, his birth. Uh, and so that's the idea of the play, but the play is about, this one act play is about Tenyo convincing her father to go, um, to go make these gifts. And the advisor is kind of like Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, um, telling the emperor how things are. And, uh, and so the play ends. And at the end of the play, my character, Hakase, uh, comes back out on stage and he, uh, he recites, um, he recites uh, four lines, which I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to s spoil the surprise, but I'm planning to tell this story uh, when we do get to read the last uh, 28 or 29 verses of the Bhagavad Gita, which I hope to do on Tuesday you know, with Kushbu, and then I'll have to edit it. Uh, but I'm going to tell this story again and I, at that point. Uh, what happened to me yesterday, and it was quite numinous, and it's part of a whole series of numinous events that have occurred to me around the Bhagavad Gita. But what happened was I remembered the whole speech verbatim. Uh, and it, it's not a short speech, it's like two or 300 words long. And of course, I had memorized it when I was in the play. Uh, but all of a sudden, all the words to it came back to me. Um, and it made me realize that that play was um, archetypally basically the same as the Bhagavad Gita, which also makes me believe that, you know, these mindsets are common. And, um, and so, as you ask this question, Isaiah, uh, I think that um, I, I think that these, you know, these early beliefs were primitive, okay, because they were developed by early Iron Age men and women, and probably even pre-Iron Age men and women in, in many cases. Uh, of course, Christianity isn't pre-Iron Age. It's it's early Iron Age, but, um, but like beliefs of the, of the early Egyptians um, and so on uh, were pre-Iron Age. And, um, and they all represent the forces that we're, we're all still dealing with and which are represented by the Tarot. And that's why the Tarot um, works. Um, because, um, it, it, you know, since 1482, the 15th century, 
uh, nobody has been able to improve on it because it is true and it is um, it's talking in the major arcana it's talking about the divine realm the realm of forces and energies which we cannot see and so that's the gist of the teaching that i've been giving now for several weeks seven or eight weeks and we'll be working on throughout the coming year uh, in the monday night group um, and so those energies are always with us and you know you can call them whatever you like but um uh nonetheless they are there and they are part of our lives everywhere on the planet um and so yeah okay there are extreme co contrasts on specific themes yeah, arguably but i you know um if we if we give give uh, the primitives the benefit of the doubt and talk about well why did they say it this way as opposed to this way you know you have to admit that there is a certain sameness to these things and um and that and what I observed in the Bhagavad Gita reading, by the way, is that it is very much like the old Cherokee legend, which I've talked about a few times. And in order for that to be true, um, the story would have had to come with human beings into North America before 11,700 years ago, uh, because that's when the last element of the Bering land bridge was separated. So in other words, human beings came into the Americas for the first time uh, about then, uh, or I'm sorry, for the last time about then. Um, and so these, these so-called Native Americans, um, you know, didn't bring that story any later than 11,700 years ago. And so the story, which is in the old Cherokee legend, um, is the same story that's in the Bhagavad Gita. And it's a basic story of humanity. It's just expressed in a different way. Um, and so there's probably a thousand PhD theses possible um, just around that idea, but nonetheless, it is true. Um, and so, um, you know, why has the Odyssey um, survived all these years it was a story about um you know the trojan war that was uh, be before the christian era and yet it was told over and over again until it became more and more and more perfect and it was first by word of mouth i don't know when the odyssey was first written down but it's um you know, very much in the same sort of spirit as the Bhagavad Gita in that sense. So those are interesting ideas to think about. Uh, so Iron Dodger, Iron Dogger says, has anyone tried the Randonautica app for synchronicity and exploration of the consciousness? Um, okay, I don't know anything about that, but I can tell you that um, that the tarot is all about synchronicity. I mean, that's how it works, in fact. Um, and, um, and the reason it works. And so, um, you know, I can explain it to you in terms of divination. And mind, mind you, I'm not um, teaching di divination in the Monday group. I already did that back in 2017 and 2018. And, and so if you want to learn divination, you can go listen to those 18 videos I did back then. Um, and I'm linking to them in every one of the Tarot um, sessions that we're doing. But 
Um, but in terms of divination, and this is true of all divination, actually, uh, and it's true of all conversations too. Uh, so let's let's talk about mental health for a moment. And the caveat emptor, I am not a mental health professional, um, and um, I anything I say is from my experience and perspective as a layman. Uh, and I'm a fairly well informed layman, but I am not a mental health professional. So keep that in mind. Now, having said that, all of us have to deal with the craziness of our lives. And the way we do that normally is by conversation. And so in communities, we have discussions with one another. Um, you know, we go out to have a beer or uh, a tea with a friend or a cup of coffee with a friend. Um, and we have a chat about whatever it is that's going on in our lives. And that's very low resolution, but it is resolution um, psychotherapy because it helps us see ourselves in a in a different way than we would just by ourselves and so you know you can travel throughout the middle east for example and everywhere you go you see uh old men sitting out in front of um, coffee shops or tea shops um, playing backgammon or whatever and what they're doing is they're basically um helping one another cope with the day and they're talking about what's happening to them in their lives etc and, and women do the same thing and sometimes men and women do them together uh, so that's a that's a low resol resolution psychotherapy now what divination does is it is in a, a class that's between just normal conversation with a friend and psychotherapy, depth psychology. So let, let me talk about the other end of the spectrum. So in, in depth psychology and an analysis, if you're working with a union analyst or any psychotherapist, they are going to delve into deep parts of your mind and they are familiar with all the, um, all the biological things that could be going wrong with your mind, for example. And so they might know about neurological things that might go wrong and so on. And so they can steer the conversation down to a specific part and help you. Um, that's not what I do and, and not what I can do. I, I'm not, I'm totally ignorant. Uh, on the mental health profession. I've never taken a psychology course, although I've been given 1,100 of them on this YouTube channel. But, um, but I don't really know the structure of the human mind from a scientific point of view. And um, so anything that I would say about that is speculative and, and that's a profession and I don't claim to be of any help in that realm. Um, and so if you have depression, you know, it can, if you're depressed, you, you know, having tea with a girlfriend might be uh, a good way of dealing with it. Um, but, um, but you might have to go to a psychotherapist. Now divination, comes between those two extremes. And so di what divination does in all its forms, so whether it's the I Ching or the Tarot or reading tea leaves or coffee grounds or, uh, you know, little hairs on the back of your neck, whatever, um, divination falls in between. And the way that works is completely by synchronicity. And what it mean, what it, I mean by that is that um, 
all of us have, let's say, sore spots in our um, psyche or areas that are tender for some reason and need addressing. We need to uh, bring them into consciousness and reflect upon them. And if we do that, uh, very often we can be helped um, because we can see things in a new light. And so the way I describe this is that I could walk into a auditorium with a thousand people present, take the tarot cards and throw them across the floor uh, with no specific layout of any kind and simply read them directly off the floor. And everyone in the room would think that I had done a reading for them. And the reason for that is that we all have different sore spots in different ways. So uh, what the Tarot allows me to do is to uh, read about the energies and experiences of life. And so if I see a major arcana card, um, like, the, like the Empress card, um, that is normally read as mother. Uh, the Empress card is normally read as mother. And so if during the reading I say something about mother, then of the thousand people, at least 250 of them will be having something going on with their mother. And so that provides an anchor and it makes them think about that. And you right away say, oh my God, he knows about my mother. Uh, well, actually, no, I don't. I just read the cards <laughs> and it just happens by synchronicity that I connected to something. And so if I do a half hour reading, let's suppose, um, you know, I'm definitely going to, um, to touch upon something that's in your unconscious, that's a sore spot or, or an issue that you need to address. But I don't know what that is, and I will never know what it is, and I don't have any mystical um, capability, but what I can do is I can point it out to you. And the way I point it out to you is by reading. And I see the Empress card. I read Mother from the Empress card in some way. And you, if you hear it, if you resonate with that idea, then it's going to cause you to reflect upon it. And that's why people do feel better after they have a divination reading, whether it's the I Ching or any other, because it will resonate with those specific parts of you. So in a normal tarot reading, I can, uh, there are 78 cards and they can be reversed. So there's 156 possible sort of approaches to reading the 78 cards. And, um, and then in a typical Celtic cross reading, you would put it out uh, in 10 different positions on the table. So now you have 156 possibilities times 10 different positions. So there's 1,560 um, different possibilities there uh, just for openers. And so however I tell that story, of the 10 positions, perhaps I will be correct or I will hit uh, hooks in your psyche three or four times, okay? Uh, I will say something that will connect with you three or four different ways. And that's true of everyone. Now, I won't have a clue what, what I meant to you, but you will have a clue. You will know what it is and you will then be able to reflect on it. And that's why divination works because it, it connects you to yourself and it connects you to your unconscious. So then you can reflect on those things. And uh, just look at one thing here. Okay. Okay. So uh, this is why I'm doing the, um, 
why I'm doing the uh, Tarot work on Monday evenings. Um, and, um, and so the idea is that we understand the energies and the experiences because um, the minor arcana represent typical experiences that we run into light into in life in various ways and um, and so um, <laughs> I'm just having a reverie about our president being the poster boy for the um, for the suit of pentacles in the tarot um, but in any case, um, the, the experiences of life are represented in the tarot card. So in terms of synchronicity, the synchronicity is that I will say something that um, by synchronicity connects to your unconscious. And I have no clue what that is. No, no reader knows what those things are. Uh, and, um, you know, but some readers uh, who are intuitive, and I happen to be quite intuitive, uh, can have a, a psychic connection with you and can call themselves psychic. So I can say that, uh, Melissa Townsend, who um, is who gave a talk on this channel a few weeks ago uh, on August the eighth, I think. Um, Melissa um, sells herself as a psychic, and she is quite psychic. And so I paid her to do a, a tarot reading of me, and I thought her reading was profound. And so, um, and that's with me knowing how this works <laughs> and realizing that um, <clears throat> in conscious point of fact, uh, she doesn't know much about me and what's happening in my life, but nonetheless, she is able to, she was able to connect with me, you know, on the telephone across the United States. She lives in San Francisco and I live here. We've never physically met. And um, she did a one hour reading for me that I thought was profound. And so if you give it the benefit of the doubt and realize that a synchronicity is going to happen and probably three or four in a half hour reading um, and that once those things are exposed, the, those, those anchors bring up something that was unconscious to, to you, then you can reflect on them. And then you can adjust your attitude or your perspective. And that's why they are a mid-level. Um, all divination techniques are mid-level between uh, professional psychotherapy, where there might be a disease or defect in your psyche and, and that might require a professional help. Um, and just an ordinary conversation because an ordinary conversation also, you know, can cause you to reflect on certain things, but it, it doesn't necessarily bring up things that are unconscious because you're having a conscious conversation with your friend, whatever it is. And so you're dealing with things that are conscious to you. And um, so that's, you know, normal conversations make us feel better, interact with people better. Um, but a divination is going to touch things that are in your unconscious that you can't discuss with a friend because you don't know them and you don't know what they are until it comes up from a divination and then you know what they are and, and then you can uh, address them. Uh, and so that's, that's sort of the difference, but that's a short exploration of uh, synchronicity, if that's helpful. Um, okay, let me see.
All right, so I've completed that opening section of part one. Um, let me see how much farther I can get here in this discussion. And by the way, I'm very thankful to all of you who have um, paid attention to this. I never imagined that um, this time frame, which is 8 a.m. on a Sunday morning, uh, which is 5 a.m. in California, I never imagined that that this time frame would bring sort of the most people that ever uh, listen to my YouTube channel. And, and so I've found that these are very popular talks, even though they're very painful for me to have to get up and be ready to go at at 8 a.m. Um, and um, and so um, let me just observe that we are now inundated by other people's imagination and by imagination in general. So uh, once again, movies um, are someone else's imagination of what is going on, and we're being led by the nose through the story of that movie. And uh, they can be incredibly imaginative, and the same is true uh, with computer games and gaming. The whole gaming industry is, is about being led through the nose by somebody else's imagination. Um, but as Dr. Jung said, who, who's going to live your life if not you? And so if you follow someone else's imagination, um, you're not living your own life, you're living somebody else's life. And that's uh, a cautionary uh, tale. And uh, if we just sit and stare at the television set or the movie screen um, or read a book, whatever it is, you know, our imagination is activated and we are experiencing those things, but we're not engaging our actual selves. And so I think that we have become lazy um, in terms of our imagination and our psychic experience. And of course, this is partially because uh, the Logos guys um, have written imagination out of the curriculum. So now we don't have, um, you know, a lot of schools no longer have music classes, they no longer have art classes, and so on. And there's a reason we need those. I mean, we, we need art classes because they initiate children who are in the process of learning how to be a human being. They teach them to, to um, learn about themselves and their own creativity. And, you know, what I, what I find is that, you know, if I get interested in something like I got interested in calligraphy, for example, um, Take care, Nick. Thanks for being here. Um, I got interested in calligraphy, and at first, my calligraphy was pretty humble. And um, but gradually, I've uh, improved it, and uh, I put it aside in March uh, when the coronavirus hit, and now I've picked it up again. So again, it's it's going back as not quite as kind as it should be again, but, but it is very rapidly starting again. And so whatever it is, whatever your creative thing is, just start and um, you'll find that very quickly your performance improves. And so um, what Dr. Jung said is this building behind me, which is Bollingen, is his confession of faith in stone. And what it means is that uh, here was a psychiatrist, professional psychiatrist, who built that building 
from the grand ground up through his own creativity. And he did so many creative things in his life. And the, and the Red Book is uh, a part, an example of that. And uh, next week, in fact, uh, in two days on Tuesday, uh, we're going to have the Black Books, which are uh, the basis for the Red Book. And that's going to be a seven volume series. They're in uh, pre-release right now. So if you haven't purchased, um, if you're interested in the black books, which are not cheap, um, they're ranging on, on uh, Amazon between 270 and $300 uh, in pre-release. Um, I urge you to put your order in before Tuesday, because once Tuesday comes and they're released, uh, then there's no telling how what the cost will be. Um, and in the case of the Red Book, um, it was selling about $150 uh, a few years ago after release. And lately, I've seen a price as high as $270 for it. So uh, these things do have a sliding scale. And so pre-release order is always a good idea. Now, Aaron Dogger says, leukemia opened my eyes to so much, but the multiple and the ease have launched me into connecting even further with the Red Book and what Jung was exploring. Um, and, uh, you know, that's great. I mean, however you get into it and get into your imagination. Now, Matt, Annette says it is so hard to trust our imagination. I can imagine that's a deep place you go to. Um, she's responding to Iron Dogger. Um, yeah, we, we go to very deep places and we experience um, truly incredible things. Um, and, you know, that's what a great artist or a great um, novelist does because they're, they're acting out, they're enacting their own imagination. And, um, and so Annette says, will you discuss the black books here? Well, yes, and that I certainly will, <laughs> but it's seven volumes, so I think we're we're going to be discussing them <laughs> for the next five years at least, <laughs> and maybe longer. I mean, here we are still talking about the Red Book and and this series that I've been reading through from Jung's Red Book for our time, searching for soul under postmodern conditions. This is volume three, but they're up to volume four and. Volume five is uh, to be issued next April. So that's 10 years into it. And from what I understand from Dr. Shandasani, um, the, he had to cut about 50% of what was available material from the Red Book. He cut about 50% of it out um, from the Black Books. And so just from this Tuesday, we're going to start to see what what's the other 50%. And some of that is um, material that the family didn't want the world to see. And uh, so we, it'll be interesting to see what was censored by either um, either Shamda, by Shamdasani himself or by the young family. Um, and what Dr. Shamdasani says about that. It'll be interesting. Um, and uh, and and that says she read the Red Book and images on Kindle. Well, um, yeah, you can do that, but I, you know, if you don't have the actual folio volume in all its weightiness. I mean, it weighs about 25 pounds and, uh, you know, it's a huge book. Um, it makes a different impression on you 
when you see that. Yes, you can get the images, and I often uh, put the some of the images up on a YouTube session that I'm doing. Uh, but if you don't have one in hand, uh, you don't have the same sort of overwhelming feeling that you have when you have the red book. Um, and, um, you know, I think uh, we're, we're going to have a, a speaker on, um, on uh, the 14th of November. Uh, and uh, I'll just share with you um, one of an image that he had because his name is uh, Kylie Lachlan and um, his, he was, uh, he's a National Guard officer and he had this idea to uh, do a sort of a, a graphic novel of the Red Book. And uh, so he's going to talk about the Red Book as a graphic novel. Uh, and so I'm going to share with you uh, one page from his discussion um, that sort of sums up my point about what happens when you actually see the Red Book. So uh, here he is, he's doing this graphic novel about the Red Book and he says, in November 2009, I returned from Kosovo to resume my life after a long deployment. So here he is returning. And he said, I'm happy to be home. And a treasure awaits me, along with nearly a year's worth of mail. And so there's the box that the Red Book was in. Uh, I already know what is in the bo box. And so he opens it. And so in this frame, he says awestruck uh, and you know that's the point and so he's even um, done you know a graphic novel version of the red book here uh, and and so that's the that's the feeling one gets when one has the actual red book now if if you don't have enough money to get your own red book uh, I would urge you to try to find one at a, at a library and um, actually sit with it for a while if you're able to, uh, because it's quite, quite an experience and you don't have to own it to have that experience. You can just find it at a library and have that experience. Um, and um, so anyway, that, that was a preview of my discussion with Kylie uh, Laughlin on uh, November 14th. And um, as I've said a few times, but I will uh, repeat here, uh, and I'm putting this on the YouTube channel chat, uh, you need to register uh, at that link and then you can participate in these a colloquia that we are having regularly. Uh, we're having one later today. I want to remind everyone uh, that we're having um, Alyssa Markov speak this afternoon, and she is talking about the sacred feminine and how the sacred feminine never went away in the Orthodox Church. And so uh, there are many uh, Sophia cathedrals in Russia, for example, and the oldest cathedral in the world, which is the Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, um, is named after Sophia. The, and Sophia is uh, a Greek word for wisdom. And it's also uh, the name of the sacred feminine. So uh, that conversation uh, colloquium uh, is today at 3 p.m. I hope you'll uh, join us then um, because it'll be a very interesting session and it will be live streamed on YouTube. Uh, if uh, I've already sent out the links for that. So if, if you are hearing this and you want the links, uh, please write to me at skip.conover at gmail.com. I'm going to give you the links on the YouTube chat. 
uh, and or this is my email address. So uh, you can write to me at that email address and say that you want to listen, you want to be a part of uh, Alyssa Markov's uh, colloquium, and I will send you the links for that. Um, but if you want to regularly get our notices, uh, then you need to go to that MailChimp sign up and register uh, with me because that's how I have a mailing list that I can um, make you aware of what's going on. And um, so I think uh, with that, I, I think I'll cut this short now. We've, I've been talking for an hour and 45 minutes and I have a long two hour session that we're going to be doing this afternoon. Uh, so I think that I'll uh, stop for now. Uh, the session this afternoon is at 3 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time, Eastern Daylight Time. Uh, so you can look at your global watch and synchronize your watches on when it will be in your area. Obviously, that's uh, 9 p.m. European Time. Um, and it's Alyssa Markov on uh, the Sacred Feminine. And I will begin, I will resume uh, my discussion of Dr. Eisenstadt's uh, essay next week with uh, the Diggs Journeying and Deep Imagination, which is the title of the next segment of his essay. And so uh, with that, thank you all for being here. I know that there's a, a large group here. I'll be happy if, if anybody wants to in the next uh, minute put up um, a question or comment that you want me to comment on, I'll be happy to do that, but otherwise I'm going to discontinue. So Napoleon says, do you have advice for someone who is facing a mother-son complex whereby one is, uh, whereby one is still corrupted by shame and doubt feelings? Um, I think just uh, the the best advice, the advice that I heard um, Edward Edinger uh, give is to reflect upon it. The, the fact that you are, um, <clears throat> the fact that you're conscious of the issue is from my perspective, 90% of the cure. In other words, <clears throat> uh, a lot of these things are unconscious and they tend to rule our lives uh, but if we make it conscious uh, then um, then we can reflect on it and determine what we should do about it i i would am willing to give you uh, one of my experiences with my own mother my own mother was uh, definitely a force of nature everybody who ever knew her um, knew that she was a force of nature and um, and so and she was fun loving and you know from the time i was five years old we were driving through um, the badlands of uh, south dakota uh, one time on the way to alaska and she she was driving she was 25 years old at the time and she, she drove three little children i was the oldest at age five but my uh, infant sister at the time was about nine months old and um and so my brother sister and i were all under five and she at age 25, drove from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Seattle by herself. Through the Badlands, through, through um, the Northern US. And that was long before there were super highways. And so it was two lane roads all the way. Uh, and, um, you know, who knows what could have happened during that 
time. I mean, she was very courageous to do that. I mean, she obviously had a, 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 a light, an out of state license plate on the vehicle. I don't, we had been living in California, so it might've been a California license plate. I'm not sure. Uh, or it was a Pennsylvania license plate. In either case, it was an out of state license plate. So here's this woman with beautiful woman with three children driving alone across huge uh, empty expanses of the United States at that time. And, um, and she did it with, with joy. And I remember during that trip, one time she was teaching me how to read a map. And, um, and so I was helping her with where she would have to turn. And this was a time long before navigation, electronic navigation. So we actually had to use a map. And uh, I remember looking up at her while she was driving along at one point and just having this sense that I was in the car with a goddess. And in point of fact, I was. Uh, but and so anyway, she obviously was quite um, influential on my life. But there came a time when I was uh, divorcing my first wife when I was um, in my parents' home. And my mother called me into the living room um, very angrily and said, you have to stop this. You have to go back to your marriage, blah, 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 blah. And it's one of the few times she ever tried to lecture me. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, I simply said, mom, <laughs> you're out of line. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was the end of it. Um, now, she had really not tried to change my opinion about anything since I was in the eighth grade. I remember one time my when I was in the eighth grade, my brother was in the sixth grade and we were heckling my sister who was probably in the second grade at the time. And she was crying and angry with us. And, um, and my mother came to swat me across the face and uh, as she did it, I just held my arm up like this, and she nearly broke her arm, <clears throat> broke her arm on my arm, and that was the last time she ever tried to hit me. <laughs> um, but in terms of um, in terms of shame and doubt, I think that the the issue is as we mature. <clears throat> we have to understand that our job up to maturity is to learn how to be a problem solver. And after maturity, um, it's solving problems. I solve problems all day long, every, all day, every day. And if, if you think about it, uh, you probably do too. I mean, from, you know, the problem of, oh, I just spilled a glass of milk <laughs> to whatever it is. Uh, to our children acting out or whatever it is. And um, so we, we are problem solvers. And, um, and so knowing the problem is half the, half, half the solution or more than half of the solution. And so reflection on that um, and knowing also that this problem that you've raised, Napoleon, of um, shame and doubt. Now that you know the problem, now you can work with it and figure out how you're going to resolve it because we can't have any doubt. I mean, that's what the Bhagavad Gita is about. Actually, it's a story about a decision to go to war. And in the Bhagavad Gita, um, Arjuna, uh, and mind you, the Bhagavad Gita takes place in a second, okay? It's, it's, a, it's a stop frame um, 
in the middle of, of a very long um, story. Okay, the story is the Mahabharata and it's a hundred thousand verses long. And the Bhagavad Gita is 700 verses long. And basically what the, uh, well, it's a song. And so in, if you think of uh, musicals in, um, in English, I mean, most recent ones were probably Chicago and so on that were in the movies or any anytime you go to Broadway, you'll, you'll see a play that has musicals. And as Kushbu was explaining this to me, um, the, the Bhagavad Gita is actually a stop action, like, you know, in a, in a play, in a musical, even in high school musicals, uh, all of a sudden the action will stop and there'll be a song and dance number played and then they go back to the action. So that's what's happening in the Bhagavad Gita. And so it occurs in the course of a second, but it's Arjuna's um, doubt about going to war because he realizes he has to go to war with his kinsmen. And Krishna, who is an avatar of um, God or the self, who is telling him, man, you have to go to war. You have to, um, you have your duty. And by duty, in this case, we're talking about your individuation. You're, you're here, you're the leader of an army. And uh, so there's no question that you're going to war. <laughs> it's just, how are you going to fight it? Are you going to fight it in your, you're going to fulfill your duty. And so, uh, I think the point uh, for Napoleon here is in terms of doubt and shame is to understand that, uh, you know, we all face doubt and shame in our lives and uh, we have to press on. We have to, um, we have to find our way through that. And however that's done, I, I mean, it may be something that requires uh, psychotherapy, I don't know, but, um, or it can be done simply by reflection and realizing that, uh, you know, you're a problem solving creature and, and you have to live your life. You're going to live decades after your wife or after your mother has died. And, um, and so you can't have any doubt about that. That's the, that's the reality of life. And, and so, um, you know, this, if you have doubt and shame, you have to find a way to get beyond that and figure out what, what, what your mother's doing maybe to make you feel shame and reflect on whether, um, whether what what you're doing is shameful or whether it's simply part of your shadow and and uh, and by that i mean a part of you that maybe you're not particularly proud about um but nonetheless it's a it's a part of um human nature and a part of um how we have to live uh, and so, you know, that's, that's what to think about. Um, and Iron Doggers asked me whether I lived in Alaska. Yes, I lived in Alaska uh, in the first and second grade. So in, from 1952 uh, to early 1954 is when I lived in Kodiak. Um, and uh, back when it was still a Navy base. That's where I lived in Alaska. And uh, good morning, Miles, nice to see you. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to uh, terminate for now. I hate to hang up on so many uh, people listening, but I really have to prepare for this afternoon. And as you see, after speaking for two hours without stopping, um, 
it starts to get to my voice. <coughs> so thank you for joining me today. And next week we will continue on. Uh, we're reading the essay by Stephen Eisenstadt, the chancellor and founder of uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute. And his essay is in this book, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, uh, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, uh, volume three. And so we will continue uh, this series uh, again next week on Sunday at 8 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time for all of those early risers <laughs> in the United States and uh, for all of my friends uh, in other parts of the world, uh, which will go unnamed, uh, but for whom I'm really doing this, uh, this series. So uh, welcome and I look forward to seeing you next week.